Amen. It's, it's, it's always an interesting and an exciting time to, to just share the word of God together. And when, when the, the leadership were praying this morning, there's this example that we, we, we discussed really about, you know, it, it's possible to be in church, but God forbid you walk out the same way you came. Amen. You, you remember Brother Anderson? He has the Bible. He was doing all the moves, but he wasn't part of it. There was this particular scripture when Jesus talked about a king who prepared a supper. And he extended an invitation to a number of people, and everybody gave an excuse. And everybody said, Oh, this is why I cannot come. I've just married a wife. I've just done this. I've just done that. Then they came back to him and said, the people are not responding. And just said, go into the highways. Anybody you can find, bring them in. And they went out into the highway, brought everybody they could find in. And there was this particular gentleman that came in, but he came in dressed in rags. And when the king looked at him, he said, why are you dressed like this? You are not dressed for the occasion. And because of that, he was kicked out. And could not partake. And when we were discussing it this morning, two examples that came to mind. That it's possible to have a supper that has been prepared for the people of God. But the first excuse the enemy will make you offer is I can't make church today. Amen. There's always something important to do. That's why I'm not doing the needful thing. That's one way he uses to more or less divert our attention. The other dimension is that you may be here but you're not dressed for the occasion amen you're not dressed for the occasion you are physically here but mentally you've checked out amen you are here but your heart is is filled with unforgiveness you are in a place in which you are not allowing the grace of god to reach you guess what? You won't be able to partake of the banquet. So even as we go into the word of God today, I want you to just in your heart settle with God. That Father, I will not mentally check out. But everything that you have prepared for me, I will open myself up to. Anything in my life that will serve as a hindrance, Lord, help me so that it will not affect what you have prepared for me today. In the name of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go into the word of God. Let's go to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Over the last um, few weeks, we've been talking about the theme of fruitfulness. And we've looked at it from different perspectives. And... By the grace of God, we'll just continue in that thing, but want to draw out one or two things as God will help us today. I'll read first of all, John 15, I'll read the first eight verses. I am the true vine, verse 1, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's open also our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew, I beg your pardon, 13. 
from verse 18. Matthew chapter 13. Read from verse 18 till 23. It says, Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who received seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful. But he who received seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. And indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty some 30. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The text or the title of the message is my seed determines my fruitfulness. My seed determines my fruitfulness. The two scriptures we've read and we've spent some time over the last few weeks looking at different dimensions and perspectives of fruitfulness. And I believe that God has been amplifying this truth more and more in our lives. I don't think there is anyone who's been coming into to church in the last month or two that is under any illusion that as a church, by the grace of God, we're in a season of fruitfulness. Amen? That is the word that God has spoken over us. That is the truth we have embraced within ourselves. That indeed, this is our time of fruitfulness. And we've looked at the fact that our fruitfulness is not in ourselves, but in God. Amen? If you recall what the scripture in John chapter 15 said, he talked about a vine that essentially, you know, um, um, anchors several branches. And I know the last time I spoke about this, Pastor Vine, you know, uh, took exception to it. And said, I, I was talking about true vine. It's not his vine I'm talking about. It's the Jesus' kind. Amen? But, but there's a true vine. And that vine is God. And we are branches that are plugged, plugged into that branch. In other words, we do not receive substance of our own selves. Our existence, our sustenance is essentially drawn from that vine. And that vine is Jesus Christ. Amen? But if you also look at where Matthew chapter 13 is coming from, the focus is talking about the harvest or the fruitfulness. But what I want us to focus on today is the seed. Is the seed. The potential of the seed. It's a, a man, Reverend Robert Schuller, who said this, and I believe he said it in a way that, that, that throws a bit more light into what we're trying to talk about. He said, anybody can count the seeds of an apple. It is only God that can count the apples in the seed. Amen? Anyone can count the number, because that's, that's just essentially looking at the seeds that you see. When you cut your apple into two, you can count them, just a handful of them. But do you know that out of one seed, how many apples are actually in it? It is only God that does. The potential of the seed. The inherent ability. It may not be obvious, but that is what the, the seed is capable of delivering. Amen? Jesus gave several examples. Particularly, he spoke about the mustard seed. The mustard seed. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 31 to 32, 
in Mark 4, 31 to 32, in Luke 13, 19, he gave us the example of the mustard seed. That even though this seed is small, when it is planted, it grows into a big tree. Amen? In other words, at the time when you're looking at the seed, it doesn't appear to have much going for it. Amen? But when you plant it, when you nurture it, when you tend to it, and it begins to grow, that little seed has the potential to be a mighty tree. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When God is talking about fruitfulness... Somewhere in the equation is the seed. And we'll look at that in a bit more detail. And a lot of times when we talk about seed, you know, we, we use the example seed time and harvest time, and immediately a lot of us tend to think about money. Amen? When you talk about seed, uh, seed time, amen, it's, it's money. It, most times, the thought tends to gravitate towards money. But we're not looking at that today because it's much more than that. Because you see, the seed itself is your life. The seed we're talking about is about our thoughts, our actions, and our words. They define us. Everything about our lives is defined by the quality of that seed that runs true. Even our harvest is linked to it. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. 1 Peter 2.23 The Bible talks about being born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, which is by the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him. Galatians chapter 3, verse 29. And if you be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed, and hears according to the promise. Amen. If you are indeed Abraham's seed, then you are what? Hears according to the promise of God. Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed. Another translation says, it's as if a man should cast seed to the ground. The seed is our life. We cannot talk about fruitfulness without talking about our lives. Amen? You cannot separate out the quality of the harvest from the quality of the seed. Isn't it? For some of us who might be in that field, you, you see all the sort of research into genetic engineering, particularly in terms of crop production. And what they're trying to define is the sort of the, the constituents of, of, of a seed to make sure that the quality of the seed will increase the yield potential. Amen? For some of our, for, for some of our brethren who are in our Greek science, and, and the, that's what they focus on the quality of the seed so that it will essentially inform the quality of the fruitfulness or the harvest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God has called us to a place in which we need to look at the seed that is involved. Because we can talk about everything. You know, it's, it's, I think it works this way. If you could follow my thoughts. You can have a good seed but you don't have the right conditions. 
you will get the wrong outputs. But you can have the right conditions, but the wrong seed. You will still get what? The wrong outcome. So there's no way you can separate harvest or fruitfulness without actually looking at the seed itself. And that seed, our thoughts, our actions, our words. And that links to our fruitfulness, like I said. Proverbs 131, therefore you shall eat the fruit of your own ways. That's what the scripture says. Proverbs 12, 14, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Proverbs 13, verse 2, a man shall eat well by the fruit of his mouth. Proverbs 18, verse 20, a man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. Proverbs 18, 21, for life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat of its fruit. You will see that in different instances, the Bible is talking about your actions, your words, essentially having a knock-on impact on your life. For some of us, you, the mystery around our circumstances is in our life. When you look at what we are gazing on repeatedly, if you examine what we keep saying repeatedly, if you look at how we act, then the consequences of what we see in our lives explains our lifestyle. Amen? The Bible says, he that will have friends must make himself what? Friendly. If you have someone who does not have any friends and, and the whole world is against him or her, but it, it's, it's not far-fetched, isn't it? There's no great mystery here. We don't need to more or less do any sort of personality assessment. You are just not what? Friendly. Amen? You are not friendly. Because the Bible says that if you are friendly, you will have what? People of God, amen? It's the scriptures. Amen? If you are friendly, you will have what? You have what? Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we talk about our life, please, even in this time of fruitfulness, as God is emphasizing it, I believe he is also stressing very, very particularly on our lives as well. And I think we need to examine ourselves, our day-to-day -day walk with him, our thought life, our actions, our deeds, are they reflective of a life that wants to be fruitful? Because you cannot divorce the two. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think if God were to open up our hearts so that we will see ourselves for who we are, some of us, the impression we have of ourselves is not really the impression God has of us. And that's where the scriptures is important. Because the scriptures are like a mirror. It, it reveals not just who you are on the surface. It reveals the intent of your heart. And that's powerful. Because you see, as a person, I can, and, and human beings would do that. You listen, isn't it? You can only go, unless God gives you the, sort of the power of intuition and you have the gift of knowledge. But you judge things by what you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you can feel. But that only goes so far. But there's something about the word of God that when it shines upon a heart, it not only assesses what is on the outside, it is able to strip the layers back and tell you what the heart is thinking. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our actions, they influence our thinking. 
Jesus said, For a man's life is not in the abundance of the things which he what he possesses. But he talks about as a man thinketh in his heart. Amen? So he is. In other words, if you are negative in your thinking, if you are very pessimistic in your thinking, that is the nature you will have around you. If you're a very buoyant person, if you're a very personable person, if you believe the best of everything rather than the worst of everything, you will find out that it will affect the way you even think and the way you are as a person. Hallelujah. So it's important for us to allow God to access our thinking. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to see how I'm going to place this. Because I know Dickness Christian also talked about this last Sunday. Um, when she was talking about thinking. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the study was, was quite instructive. Because what a lot of us Christians fail to do is to actually assess the quality of our thoughts. It's very easy for you to judge the actions around you. But you don't really judge the quality of your thoughts. Someone said it well. It said the mind of the, oh, sorry, yeah, the, the mind, the mind of the oppressor, is in the mind. The mind of the, the strength of the oppressor is in the mind of the oppressed. If the enemy can control your thoughts, if the enemy can influence your thinking, the enemy can influence your life. If the devil is going to win you, he will first of all come from the realm of your thoughts. If he cannot deal with your thoughts, then there is very limited what he can do in your life. So he focuses on your thoughts. So for us as Christians, in terms of how we assess ourselves, yes, don't just look at situations on face value. Ask yourself the question, is there anything in my life that is producing what I'm seeing in my life. Amen? Is there anything happening within me? Is my life filled? Remember Mr. Anderson, isn't it? And, and he, was, he was running about because his heart was not dwelling on the right things. So it's easy for the enemy to assault it with fear. And where fear comes, it's easy for the demonic influence to attack and cripple him. A lot of times, where we give up our influence and our power is that we are not disciplined as to what we are allowed into our lives. I was telling someone earlier, and, and, and this person was counseling an individual, you know, and, but the individual had, was going through a bad period. They, they, they were quite depressed, so depressed that they were constantly under a sort of suicidal influence. But you find that that's the person you're dealing with all the time. And I advised the person, I said, don't just go into it thinking you're just being a friend. Be very careful so that the mood around this person doesn't come into your life. It's not to say that you don't reach out, but do it with your eyes open. Amen? Amen? Do it with a level of understanding. It's not just you being nice. And a lot of we've entered into, into those sort of issues in which you, you kind of access a situation because of someone you associated with. That the spirit they had on them, it just transferred into your life. It's even so much so pronounced that even in the, in the, in the, in the, in the TV programs we watch, your thoughts are influenced by what you allow repeatedly into your life. You find that after a while, you begin to think the way they're thinking. You, in the, in the, in the name of being empathetic, you know, to enjoy the show, you now begin to adopt the lens from which they see the world. What you're doing, essentially, is that you're opening up 
windows into your lives. We have to be careful. So that the things that dominate our lives are things that are informed by the scriptures, not just by opinions. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the book of Acts, and, and you see this thing, this thing is powerful. In the book of Acts, you have the sort of the seven sons of Sceva. And they, they went and they were going to handle a, a, a demonic man. And what did he say to the demonic man? He said, we adjure you in the name of Christ, whom Paul preaches. But what the demon-possessed man said is, he says, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. I don't know who you guys are. And seven of them got beaten up by this madman. Amen? But you see, that's, that's life in itself. If you don't know the truth for yourself, and that's why that scripture is powerful, the truth, and you shall know the truth. And so it's important to actually preface that. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? A lot of times the focus is on the latter part. The truth shall make you free. But the strength in that is in the previous one. And they shall know. It is the truth you know that will liberate you. It is the truth that you know that is able to deliver you. It is the truth that you know that is able to handle your thought process. It is the truth that you know that is able to handle your actions and your words. And it is that truth that is able to set you free. But a lot of times the focus is, you know, celebrating the promises of God, but you're not appropriating it to yourself. You are aware of generally that God is good, but is he good to you? You know that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. But in your time of trouble, do you know that name to run into? The righteous is more excellent than his neighbors. He said, I have more understanding than my tutors. When you are going through your examinations, is that the same mindset you go into that exam with? Or is it just God? Just let me pass. Your thoughts dominate your life. Because your thoughts influence your actions. I mean, <laughs> I've used this example before, so I can't get into trouble again by using it. In, in the olden days, I used to have this boxer called Mike Tyson. You, you remember, for those of you who follow boxing, a lot of the battle is lost or won before the fight has started. All the sort of the psyching they're doing, jumping on the table and down, it's to out the other person. Because you know that if you can get into this person's head, they've lost the battle. There was this particular fight. It had been built up, I think it was in the, in the 90s, I think. It had been built up as the sort of the fight of the year. You had two heavyweight contenders. One was a champion. One was a sort of a rising contender. And this is the man who is going to take the throne from Tyson. Michael Spinks. And everybody had been ramping up the fight. This is the fight everybody has been willing to see. The ticket prices of the ringside um, seats were running into tens of thousands. Everybody wanted to see this fight. Both fighters came in. Mike Tyson, you could see him prowling like a lion. He was just, you could see that meanness in his look. Then you saw Michael Spinks come out. And when they were facing each other, you could see fear in Spinks' eyes. Amen? You could see fear in his eyes. 96 seconds later, he was out. Amen? Now, he can handle Tyson to a distance. He might not be able to beat him. But he could have handled him. But by the time he started the fight, the fear, amen, the fear had crippled all the training. 
he was, he was just running, trying to avoid being punched. When the first one landed, he was out. Amen? But do you know that in life, that is how we approach it? That before you even enter into the situation, the enemy has outside you. So you are going through the motions of, you are entering that exam hall, but you have received your failure in advance. You are entering into that interview room, but in your heart, you know, when you looked at the people who were walking in with you, amen, and you said, ah, the question that comes to your mind is, what am I doing here? If, did I, you, you check the room again. Is this, is this the right room or not? Before You might even be the best. But because fear has crippled you, when it comes to the time to perform, you, ju- you just find out that you're stuttering. What, 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 what is your name? Amen? You can't, you can't even control yourself or put a sentence or two together because why the enemy has so much infected your life with fear for some people it's it's you know it's the fear of you falling ill in itself and you know thank god for medicine and and where god is taking us i mean they have new developments in what you call gene therapy isn't it and, and what I find amusing is the doctors are able to say, you do not have the disease yet. But based on what we are seeing, there is a high probability for you to have that disease. And on that basis, some people's lives have been truncated right from there. It's not that it's a certainty. It is a high probability. And on that basis, people have taken drastic decisions about their lives. Amen? The thoughts. The thoughts, they are powerful. The thoughts, they define you. You can be saying, God, I believe you, all shall be well, but in your heart, you're expecting the worst. Amen? In your heart. I think it was was Gio who was who was preaching preaching on Friday, I think Friday or Thursday. Uh, they're having the, the annual congress in, in Nigeria. And I think he was giving the example of a lady who had a daughter and the daughter was expecting a set of twins. And when she went to the hospital, she was told that the twins had died and the daughter had died. So there were three dead bodies waiting for her when she got to the hospital. But what was funny was the response of this woman. And she just said, when they told her the news, she said, can I go and attend to the children first of all? And she took with her an anointing oil that she had stood in the place of agreement with them on to say, this is my testimony, nothing is withholding or denying me that. When to the children and just saw them. Yeah, you guys, wake up. And just dropped an oil into their mouth. Each. Some minutes later, the two kids woke up. She said, now let me go and attend to the mother. She went and did the same thing to the mother. And instead of three dead bodies, amen, three like this. Because what? She believed. Even though, and you know, we're saying this in the context of just over a week, we lost a dear one to us. But recall what we said the week before. Even if God in his sovereignty decides that our sister goes to glory with him, we will still believe him that he is the one who is able to heal any type of sickness. Amen? Why? Because the thoughts are powerful. Once you begin to embrace it, that it is possible that there are some types of illnesses 
that God cannot handle. Guess what? When it happens to you, you won't have faith to fight. Amen? When it comes to you, they say this is what they call cancer. And you have seen cancer slay the, the mighty. When it comes near your doorstep, you've been outside before the fight started. Amen. The enemy has taken control. Unless you begin to fight it. You begin to, within yourself, rebel against the token of the enemy. And you know, sometimes when you're saying this, it's easy to say it when news are good. Amen. But what happens when you have to say it? When the news is not so pleasant. I was talking to the ministers this morning. There was a minister um, from Ghana I was listening to yesterday night. And he was talking about his experience. Magnificent man of God. His understanding of the scriptures. Impressive. And he was going to have this huge annual conference they normally do. And on the day the conference was going to start there was an accident, unfortunately. And there were four people that got killed. Two of them were his daughters. And he was supposed to preach that. And he was saying it. When he was saying it, he said, look, guys, I am speaking to you as a man who has had his own fair share of difficulties. And his friends were with him then. And they said, he stood. People will understand. Step aside. For some months, just go away. But in himself, he said, if I'm silent today, I'll be silent for a long time. So he encouraged himself. He said, he stood that day and preached. The day he lost two of his daughters. He said, the next day, in the morning and in the evening, I preached again. He said, after all of this went, my wife and I went away. And when he was praying, he said he heard what God told him. He said, he stood, my grace is available. Will you receive it? Amen? He said, that was all he heard. He said, Father, I'm prepared to take it. And that was how he was able to move on. Even with the scars, still proclaiming Jesus everything. That is faith. Amen? That is faith. Hallelujah. There's a particular quote I have here. Just read it to us. It says, it said, the steps of faith it falls on the seeming void and finds the rock beneath. Amen? It falls on the seeming void and finds the rock beneath. Abraham's steps of faith, he left all for God. He left all with God. He found all in God. And yielded all to God. Profound. Amen. Falling into a seeming void. And in doing that you now find the rock. There are times and we're going through that as a church. That it's easy to say, ah, we lost the dear one. Yes, we did. But God is still God. We are going to fight. So that. The influence of the enemy will not lay hold upon our thought process. We will still stand with confidence to say that Jesus is still Lord. We will still stand together in the place of agreement to say regardless of what the enemy might have said, regardless of what the doctors may have pronounced, if God said it, it will still come to pass in your life. Call not a confederacy what the people call a confederacy. Neither shall you fear the fear, said the Lord of hosts. 
but sanctify the Lord your God and let him alone be your fear and your dread. Amen? Do not call a confederacy what the experts call a confederacy. Neither shall you fear their fear, but sanctify him in your heart, in your thought process. Get that right, and the enemy has no room to come. The seed influences the fruitfulness. The seed is our life. Our life is influenced by our thought process. So you cannot disconnect all of this together. People of God, let's go back and begin to ask God, to change our mindset or rather do something about your mindset because a lot of times apart from knowing the truth and not doing it it's the fact that you don't even know the truth at all you haven't taken time to pursue the truth the joke is made sadly about Christians if you want to hide things from Christians hide it in a book we don't read. We don't read. But that needs to change. And some of the things we're saying about the word of God. Remember, if he told Joshua, he said, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But thou shalt meditate on it day and night. For therein, in it, in that word, will you observe to do. And it will make your way prosperous. And you'll find what? Good success. So God has already told us, this is where the solution is. Seek it with all your heart. Pursue it with everything on the inside of you. In doing that, you will build a hedge around yourself. Our thoughts matter. Some of us, it's the thoughts of our families. And I thank God that last week when Pastor Dami was preaching, he was preaching and asking us to pray about certain things Concerning the lineage in our families. Because you have started to define yourself with the shortcomings you see in your family. Amen? Oh, we have high blood pressure. It is what we normally have in our family. Amen? You are diabetic. Yes, it is a genetic disease. It is what we have in our family. Amen? Amen? We are stingy. We are like that in our house. We, it is what we inherit as part of what? My family. I'm not going to mention the tribe now. Amen? I'm not getting into trouble. Hallelujah. Amen. This is just a joke, really. It's not like that. I know it's not like that because I'm related to people who are from that part. And they're not like that. Amen. I'm speaking in parables now for those of you who can't understand. But you see, we are allowing things into our lives because we haven't taken the time to fight it. So what the enemy is doing is he's dropping those seeds on the inside. Dropping those seeds on the inside. When the time comes to fight, you don't have any strength. Why? Because the thought process has, as it were, crippled you totally. Remember the story of David and Goliath. You know that the battle actually ended before it started. Or oh, you didn't know that? That what they were doing with one another before the, tro- the, the stones were, what was even thrown was they were psyching each other out. What did Goliath said, he said, Am I a dog? Please give me someone my size. It is you they sent. It's not a fair fight. If you are the person that they're saying that to, how will you feel? If you are carrying the armor of Saul at that point in time, that armor will just progressively be heavier and heavier. Amen? But what did he say? David had taken time to prepare. He said... You come with me with this, but I come in the name of the Most High God. He had, before the stone was flung, the heavens had already parted. So when that stone was released, it wasn't just a stone. It was a force that was released. 
Hallelujah. Proverbs 18, 21. The power of life and death is in the mouth. Some of us, we speak, the words are wrong. They are wrong. You are not being British by just being, you know, as British, we always have this thing of, you're either understated as a, as a person, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm British, that's how I talk. Really? Amen? Of all the things to take on, is the self-limitations you are now identifying with. It shouldn't be. The Bible says, be wise as doves. Be what? Bold. Be bold as lions. Or why is a serpent? Be bold, gentle as doves, why? but also be bold as a lion. Let it be self-assured. They look at you and, you know, there's something about your demeanor that says this one commands authority. Amen? You are shaking the hands and your hands are, you know, should I, it's not even sweaty, it's whether the hands should even be there in the first place. No, let it be firm. Encourage yourself. This is why in the morning, in the day, you need to take some time to prepare yourself. A lot of times you run into life, we're not prepared. So the enemy that we're going to face is prepared. The one that we're entering into, we are not prepared. It's not a fair fight. So he comes and he defeats us repeatedly over and over again. But what God is saying is, take some time to deal with it. The seed is important. Your thought process is important. The words you speak, they're important. Your actions, they're important. Hallelujah. For some of us, in, at the beginning of the month, you are, you are, you are trying to plan for the, for, the, for the month ahead. This is what God has said concerning his promise. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, and running over shall men, you know, give to your bosom. So you know that. But you also look at the bills on the right hand side. You look at what has come in, and you look at what is going out. And for some reason, the equation seems to be weighed in the other direction. In other words, there is more going out than coming in. What will a logical mind tell you? You see that tithe that God has called for, God will understand. You can defer that to another time. Do this first. Sort this one out first. Now, in saying this, God is not saying that you should be frivolous about your responsibilities. That's not what God is saying. God is not saying that you shouldn't be responsible. That's not what the scriptures are saying. But he's saying that you need to live by faith. In other words, trust me that all your commitments and obligations, I will help you to do them when you honor me first. Amen? That battle, first of all, is won in the mind. That battle is won, first of all, in the mind. Believe it. Embrace it. Then you can know that even if something is happening and you don't have, there's a difference between being broke and being poor. You know that. You get the example of, of, of the billionaire in America, Donald Trump. The year he was bankrupt, I think he was only owing hundreds of millions of dollars in debt. And he was walking down the streets of Manhattan and he saw a man who was poor and he dipped his hands in his pocket and gave the man a very large donation, maybe several hundreds or a thousand or even more. And someone looked at him and said, Donald, but why did you do that? Is that easy? I'm broke. He's poor. But he's a billionaire back now. Okay? He's, he, has, he has all the money back that he lost. So understanding that in everything, it is a heart that is wealthy, that will know that you don't eat your seed, but you plant it. Amen? You do not eat your seed, you invest it. Because in investing, it becomes more. In investing, God is able to multiply. And that's what God is asking of us today. That in this time of fruitfulness, 
your thoughts, your actions, your words. Take some time to assess them. Allow God to influence your thoughts once again. Allow God to influence your speech. Some of us, the way we speak outside is different from how we speak in church. Amen? But you see, what really matters is what you see outside. Your actions in church is totally different from the actions you display on the street, in your workplace, in your family. Let's allow God to change that. In changing that, God is able to more or less step us into that realm of fruitfulness that we desire. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I think my time is far spent. Amen. Just three things we will say. In terms of the seed, you have the right kind of seed. Don't let the enemy deceive you to say that there's nothing good about you. Your heritage, it means nothing. Because why? He that is in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, he said, 1 Corinthians 1, he said, Christ has been made for us our righteousness. He has been made for us our righteousness. In other words, through Christ, you have a right standing with God. Let us know and embrace who we are in Christ Jesus. Romans 12, 1 to 2. He said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Amen? Be, the, it's, it's like you keep looking at the glass. And the image you see in the mirror begins to influence the image you begin to have or the perception you have of yourself. As God says, even though I am poor, I am rich in Christ. That is the image you begin to carry on the inside. He says unto you that even though at the moment the facts might be that, yes, you might be in some pain at the moment, but the truth is by his stripes you have been made whole. That is the image you keep gazing on. As you begin to look at that, it influences your thought process. Then you can get to a point in your life. By faith, you tell the devil, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind. Over my family, I've changed my mind. Over my marriage, I have changed my mind. Over my children, I've changed my mind. Over my career, I've changed my mind. Over my walk with God, in terms of being holy and righteous... I have changed my mind. Because why? The word of God is accessing. And in accessing, it's doing that cleansing and renewing. Hallelujah. The seed is powerful. The seed is powerful. The second point, very quickly. For that seed to grow, the seed must first of all die. That seed must die. F.B. Mayer said, he said, it's not the quantity of faith, but the quality of faith that is important. And he gave this analogy. He said, a grain of mustard seed and a pellet of dust are similar in appearance, but the difference between them is immense. One has no life burning at the heart of it, while the other contains life as God kindles it. Faith that has it. The principle of faith is a faith with God in it. Amen? Amen? It's not about the quantity, but the quality. Allow yourself to rest in God a bit more. We've tried it with our own hands too much. Some of us, we are fantastic planners. You plan it, you even plan God in or out of the equation. You plan his exit and you plan his entry. Guess what? God owns the plan. Let go of it. Allow God to say, Lord, your will is way more than I could ever have for myself. In Jeremiah 29, he said, I know the thoughts I have for you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. So even if before I was born, you were already saying that about me. How, can, how much can I know now? 
for me to think I can now carry the responsibility away from you and put it on myself. No, let God be God. Your life is in his hands. Don't fret about tomorrow. Don't worry about how things will turn out. Some of us even, you know, you've gotten to an age in which we tell, oh, you should be married, you should be settled by this time, you should be having kids by this time. Who said that when God says it's time, whatever the age will be, it will be the right time. Amen? Don't allow yourself to, to be overturned by what you can see physically. Focus on the word of God. Focus on the word of God. Hallelujah. Last one, the seed on its own does not yield fruitfulness. It needs to be planted. It needs to be planted. And there are three dimensions I have in there. One is to grow, which is to develop, develop with God. The other is to give, which is an act of service. Get involved. Get involved. The seed will cost you. Your seed will cost you. Please remember that. But it's in giving of it that you're able to gain, which is the third. The Bible says that he that will save his life will lose it. And he that will lose his life will what? Gain it. In other words, he that will invest his life, particularly in eternity, is the one who will get it back multiple. Hallelujah. If you plant for a year, you plant grains. This quote says, if you plant for 10 years, you plant trees. If you plant for a 100 years, you plant men. If you plant for eternity, plant the word of God. Plant the word of God. Hallelujah. And the Lord of harvest will give you seed so that it will yield the harvest that he has declared over your life in the name of Jesus Christ. People of God, let us go into the week with a sense of assurance, a sense of hope that the God of the harvest has given me seed and that seed will work out in my thoughts, in my actions, in my ways. And in doing that one, I will embrace the fulfillment and the totality of what God has purposed for me in my life. And that will be my testimony in the name of Jesus. That will be your testimony as well in the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter what has gone before you. What is important is what is in front of you. Amen? What is in front of you I'm not sure who was giving the example of the automobile now. The difference between someone who is driving and you have, you know, you have the windscreen in front of you. That's where you're supposed to focus the bulk of your attention. Amen? And a lot of times people tend to focus their attention on the rear view mirror. Guess what? You're not moving forward quick enough. No, let the past go. Let the past go. Learn from it, but move on. Some of you, you are crippled. The things you are going through now are the things you are still holding to from yesterday. Let it go. The failures, the disappointments, let it go. Some of you, the mistakes that you have made, let it go. The blood of Jesus is enough. Amen? He that is in Christ is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things have become. Allow God to establish you in the place of fruitfulness that he has called you at this point in time. It is a new day, people. It is a new day. As Isaiah said, it arise and shine, for your light has come. And that will be our testimony in the name of Jesus Christ. It shall be well with us. Hallelujah. Shall we just bow down our heads as we pray this morning? Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you, Father, Lord God, for the seed, which is the word of God. Father, thank you, Lord, because in our lives you will have a free will, O oh God, to do as you please with us, O oh God. Lord, we pray that, Lord, our hearts will receive the fulfillment of that which you have proposed for us, O oh God. 
in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us, just, let us just not be hearers of the word alone, but let us be doers as well in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we bless your name. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen.